Okay, so our speaker is Oliver Bourdain, uh, uh, and uh, he's been a leader in developing really very interesting cascade reactions involving palladium catalyzed uh, CH functionalization. And the title of his talk is Palladium Catalyzed Enantioselective Carbon SP3 CH Activation. Welcome, Olivier. Thank you. Thank you very much you, for uh, this kind invitation to, uh, to participate to this uh, very interesting meeting and very exciting and uh, also very new. Uh, I hope everything will work well. We will see. So, um, indeed, I, I would just like to give you a brief overview of uh, my group's activities. So we are essentially interested in the, the formation of carbon-carbon bonds, so de developing new methods based on transition metal catalysis and in particular uh, palladium catalysis. And we have two, uh, two main topics uh, currently in the group. So the first one is the one I, I'm going to talk about today based on an intramolecular CH activation step. And we also have another uh, topic, which is uh, a remote functionalization topic using a migratory uh, uh, mechanism, so chain walk mechanism, so that I will not talk about today. And so uh, for uh, now about 15 years, we've been interested in uh, CH bond functionalization, in particular the functionalization of uh, non-activated, non-acidic non SP3 CH bonds, which of course, as everyone knows uh, in this audience, uh, is uh, particularly challenging uh, due to the issues of reactivity and selectivity uh, associated with this, uh, uh, this, uh, this topic. And um, we are essentially synthetic organic chemists and uh, our goal is to develop step economical methods that could be then further employed for the construction of more uh, complex molecules such as uh, natural products and uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients. So just to put our work uh, into a, a broad context, we are uh, using an intramolecular, intramolecular organometallic um, approach and so the general um, uh, mechanism is uh, recalled on this slide. So in the typical catalytic cycle, we start with the pre-coordination of the metal to the, to the substrate. And this pre-coordination uh, triggers an intramolecular CH activation step uh, leading to the formation of a carbon metal bond. So an organ metallic intermediate then undergoes functionalization in or intramolecularly and for, uh, formation of a carbon-carbon or carbon heteroatom bond. So there are essentially two um, substrate binding modes that have been studied in the in the literature. Uh, and the first and most important is the uh, directed CH activation, so coordination to a Lewis basic uh, directing group um, that was uh, pioneered by the group of uh, Murai and June with rhodium and rhodium catalysis in the late 1990s and uh, uh, with palladium two uh, by Melanie uh, and Fortune when you and Olaf uh, in the mid 2000s. And many other groups, of course, became uh, active in the field. Uh, in parallel to these efforts, we have studied another approach which consists of using an oxidative addition to a zero valent palladium complex. And this leads to the formation of the first carbon palladium bond, and then after CH activation, the second carbon uh, palladium bond. And the main outcome of this uh, uh, transformation is the, the generation of a CC bond. From the so it's a nice way to make uh, different kinds of rig system. Actually, the first reaction that we found back 15 years ago is the, the formation of olefins from bromoarenes containing a linear alkyl group. Um, and so using palladium zero phosphine catalysis and the base, CH activation in this case is followed by a beta H elimination leading to the formation of, of the olefin. And when beta hydride elimination or beta hydrogen elimination is not possible or disfavored, then CC reductive elimination occurs. And uh, this leads to the formation of fused uh, ring systems. And the first type that we've been able to make were cyclobuterine, so fused formamid rings. But then we showed, and then other groups as well showed that this could be extended to the formation of fused five-membered rings, including carbocycles and heteroatoms, including the groups of uh, the, the late Kitsfanyu and the group of Uno uh, in Japan. Um, and we also showed that this could be extended to non-aromatic precursors. So for instance, bromocyclohexines lead to uh, a very valuable uh, exile windows that can be then further employed in uh, alkaloid synthesis. Um, the use of acyclic bromoalkenes with an amide linker leads to uh, gamma lactams and fused gamma lactams uh, using carbon chlorides as precursors for the palladium zero catalysis uh, allows to uh, generate uh, important beta lactams and fused beta lactams. And also more recently, we showed that we could uh, extend the uh, reaction leading to uh, cyclobuterines to the nitrogen analogs, which are benzazetidines. But actually, these are not stable enough under the reaction conditions, and they undergo, uh, undergo a 4 pi, a 6 pi electrocyclic reaction cascade to give benzoxazines in the end. 
And so um, just uh, briefly, I would like to, uh, to uh, remind you the, the mechanism of this reaction. So this was essentially studied by the group of uh, Fanu with uh, Gorelsky in Canada and our group, both experimentally and by using DFT calculations. And so we start with a classic oxidative addition to a palladium zero complex, followed by substitution of the halides with the base, which is either a carbonate uh, or a carboxylate. And in the last case, uh, carboxylate can be used catalytically as well. So this leads to this palladium complex that then undergoes CH activation via the now well-established uh, CMD, uh, or also known as uh, AMLA mechanism. Uh, so concerted uh, carbon palladium bond formation and uh, deprotonation. And so just uh, as an illustration on the left, you have two computed transition states um, illustrating that actually there are different subtypes. Uh, so on the top, you see that the base, which is uh, carbonate, uh, activates the, the CH bond in the trans uh, geometry and in the, uh, on the bottom, uh, the, this is the, the cis uh, activation mode. So there are different possibilities for, for this, uh, this CMD mechanism. Uh, usually the CH activation step is the uh, rate emitting step of the catalysis, which uh, is, uh, can be proven by, uh, uh, for instance, using kinetic isotope effects. Uh, at this stage, uh, the coordination, uh, I would like, just like to, to emphasize the, an important point, which is the site selectivity of the CH bond cleavage. The first important parameter is the, the distance between the CH bond and palladium, favoring the formation of five versus six, seven, and higher numbered uh, rings. And then when uh, the two different types of CH bonds are equidistant to palladium, then the second parameter uh, becomes the uh, predominance, which is a CH bond type, and sp2 CH bond, as well as cyclopropane CH bonds that are halfway uh, between sp2 and sp3, are the most uh, active, the most uh, reactive bonds, followed by classic alkyl CH bonds, and among these, primary are more reactive than secondary, and finally tertiary, which are uh, almost inert for this, this type of mechanism. So from the Palada cycle, the coordination of the protonated base is followed by reductive elimination, uh, which may become the right step if you generate a, a very strained main system. And the, the carboxylates, if uh, you use a carboxylate, can be regenerated uh, and used catalytically uh, uh, in combination with a stoichiometric carbonate. Okay, so uh, I would like to, um, uh, to talk essentially about uh, enantioselective uh, versions of this reaction. So there are actually uh, three types that are possible. So the first and most studied one is the desymmetrization of enantiotopic alkyl groups. Uh, so if you have a substrate with two identical alkyl groups, which is obviously a carol, and you use a carol catalyst, then you can desymmetrize these two alkyl groups. And this leads to a product with the serogenic center, uh, which is uh, created remote to the activated CH bond. The second type um, uh, deals with um, carol racemic substrates, and this is kinetic resolution. So if you have uh, only one activated uh, alkyl group or two different alkyl groups, but that uh, react at different rates, uh, then uh, this uh, process can lead to a classic kinetic resolution, and in particular with reaction of the most reactive primary CH bond. And in the second subtype, uh, if both alkyl groups uh, react at comparable rates, then you can come up with a parallel kinetic resolution leading to the formation of uh, two and two enriched uh, regioisomers. And the third type is actually the less studied, uh, it's activation of an antitopic uh, secondary CH bonds leading to the formation of a stereocenter at the activated CH bonds. I will essentially talk about the first type uh, and a little bit about the, the second one. Uh, and so um, in parallel to our work, um, the different groups started to report uh, in anti selective um, versions of this reaction. So the first uh, reaction that was actually reported is the enantioselective version of the racemic synthesis of indolines and fused indolines initially reported by Ono in 2008. And so Peter Kundig first reported uh, high enantioselectivity is uh, using uh, C2 symmetric carbines, uh, for instance, the one shown on the, on the left. And then uh, closely, closely after, Henri Cagan reported uh, also a similar version using this uh, methyl dufos, so carol diphosphine, but likely the active a ligand is actually the monophosphine oxide. And then finally, Nikolai Kramer also reported an enantial selective synthesis using uh, this uh, bulky carol monophosphine ligand. And so in parallel to this work, we looked at a different substrate, which is this one shown on the, the top left, which is this uh, acarol uh, and very simple precursor containing two isopropyl groups that are enantiotopic. Actually, there are four stereotopic methyl groups on this molecule. And so activating one um, 
of these four methyl groups leads to the formation of the mundane with two adjacent stereocenters. And to cut a long story short, we found that, that uh, this uh, bulky uh, carol binepin ligand, so uh, binepins were initially developed by uh, Matthias Beller and Gladiani for asymmetric hydrogenation. So uh, by designing a binepin with a bulky ferrocene substitute on the phosphorus, uh, we could uh, develop an enantioselective selective reaction. Note that the base is also important and has an effect on the enantial selectivity and the most uh, enantial selective uh, base was actually just uh, simple carbonate in combination with the polar solvents such as DMSO. And so using 2% palladium, 3 more percent ligand, we could uh, achieve a relatively good dia and enantial selectivities for this, uh, this transformation. And so what is, um, uh, so Eric Klo, uh, with whom we have a long-standing collaboration at the University of Montpellier, did, did some uh, 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 DFT calculations in order to, uh, to understand the origins of the natural selectivity and you have here uh, the um, major, uh, the transition state leading to the major enantiomer on the left and uh, the one leading to the minor enantiomer on the right and it seems that uh, there, there are more uh, London dispersion interactions in the uh, TS uh, leading to the major enantiomer and in particular one crucial interaction seems to be this CH pi interaction between the, the methyl group, which is geminal to the activated, uh, the CH activated methyl group, and one of the naphthyl ring of the ligand, which is not present in the transition state leading to the, the minor and the tumor. So there is not much, but this seems to be uh, sufficient to induce uh, enantial selectivity. And note that if you replace the isopropyl groups with uh, cycloalkyl groups, then now you have only secondary uh, CH bonds that are accessible. And there are actually eight stereotopic CH bonds. They are all stereochemically different. And so by cleaving one of these eight CH bonds and forming a CC bond, you generate a fused tricyclic product with now three adjacent stereocenters. So it's a very simple way uh, to, uh, to build complexity, stereochemical complexity. Uh, and just by refining the ligand structure and uh, replacing potassium, the cesium carbonate, we were also able to, uh, to get high in selectivities. And we see essentially only one based horizon, which is the one shown. Um, on this slide. Um, uh, so two years ago, we developed uh, a synthesis of beta-lactams starting from carbon monochloride precursors, which have uh, been employed before us by the group of uh, Takemoto. Um, and so we wanted to, to develop as well an enantial selective version of this reaction. So this is again a decimetrization. In this case, we decimetrized the two methyl groups on the isopropyl substituents of this nitrogen and we create this beta-lactame uh, with uh, a tri-substituted stereogenic center. So it's a very simple way to make, uh, to make our uh, enantio-enriched beta-lactams. But it was a long story to develop an enantio-selective version. And so uh, the first hit was obtained with Tadol-derived uh, phosphoramidite and phosphonites. As you can see, the ER was relatively uh, modest. And then by optimizing completely the, uh, the backbone, so the Tadol backbone and the phosphorus substituents, we came up with this uh, relatively complex phosphonite ligand, which allowed to achieve a relatively good, not, not perfect, but uh, I would say decent enantial selectivity for this simple transformation. And then uh, another possibility to induce enantial selectivity in such reactions is, is to actually use a, a Carl base instead of a Carl ancillary ligand. So this was the kind of uh, very simple design that we had at the, the beginning of the story. Actually, there were already um, a couple of tries in the literature, so in the same papers uh, by Kagan and Kramer that I mentioned before, um, they were using already, um, uh, trying to use chiral carboxylic acids in combination with uh, a chiral ancillary ligands. So in the first case, there was actually no ancillary ligands and using bulk vadin, uh, they were able to uh, get a trace of product with uh, low but significant enantial selectivity. And in the second case, uh, the group of uh, Nikolai um, used an a chiral uh, NHC in combination with this chiral carboxylic acid, also to get a modest but significant enantial selectivity. Um, in parallel, we had relatively uh, moderate results using chiral carboxylic acids, and then we turned to the use of the very popular uh, binol derived phosphates. And also, to cut a long story short, it, it took us a long time to, to develop efficient conditions. Um, and they are shown on this slide. So, we used the uh, well defined acarol palladium B tricyclic phosphine in combination with 10 more percent of the phosphoric acid uh, um, uh, precatalyst, which is the, the precursor of the active phosphate in combination with stoichiometric cesium carbonate. We tested two dozens of these uh, uh, binol derived phosphoric acids and only this, this particular one with the 
CF3 groups at the meta position that gave uh, a, um, significant energy selectivity. So it's a relatively narrow uh, optimization in this case. The solvent is also important as well as the presence of molecular sieves to, to remove traces of water responsible for, for a background racemic reaction. And so using these precise conditions, we are able to, uh, to obtain, uh, to achieve enantial selectivity that are comparable uh, to the ones uh, that you can get with uh, the best Carol and silver ligands like our energies. Uh, and so it's a nice way to make um, uh, indolins with a tri-substituted sterogenic center uh, but also indolins with tetra substituted serogenic centers are uh, accessible with a little bit lower but still uh, good enantial selectivities. Um, and what do we know uh, on the mechanism of this reaction? I would say not much, but these are the elements that we have at the moment. We know that if you form the cesium phosphate uh, and use it stoichiometrically without any uh, carbonate, then there is no reaction. In addition to that, uh, if you don't use the phosphoric acid but only uh, carbonate, then you observe a slow uh, but significant background reaction. So it seems that carbonate is uh, completely required. So it's likely carbonate that does the, 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 the proton attraction in the, in the CMD mechanism. We also know that cesium plus is required. So replacing cesium with uh, rubidium or potassium carbonate leads to a racemic product. And finally, we have a linear effect uh, of the uh, E of the product versus the E of the phosphoric acids. So this is our current hypothesis. Uh, I don't have uh, like a better picture for this or a deep calculation, but we believe that the phosphate is just a, a nice chiral counter on iron, and it's not basic at all, actually. And it's probably linked to uh, carbonate via cesium uh, um, bridge, but we don't know uh, if there are more than one uh, molecules of cesium carbonate involved. And this is somewhat consistent with uh, literature work, including by the, the books of uh, Jim Kwan and uh, Jamal Adin Muzaev, with the role of cesium. Note that under these conditions, we observed a weak but a classic kinetic resolution. So if you take this racemic precursor that has a methyl and ethyl group, uh, the reaction occurs only at the methyl group. The results are modest, but still uh, significant. And that, that, that's actually the first example of a, a kinetic resolution that we should improve, of course, in the future. But I would like to, to, to stress out that uh, if you, um, um, when Peter Kindig was using exact, the exact same substrate, and with a Carl carbine, actually, uh, he obtained a completely different behavior, which is a parallel kinetic resolution, because in this case, the Carl catalyst is reactive enough to activate the methyl and ethyl groups at similar rates. And this leads to the production of these two uh, isomers, regioisomers that are both financial enriched. And finally, in the last couple of minutes, I would just like to, uh, to show you an application in natural product synthesis. So we were interested in these three uh, natural products in, uh, that are actually uh, sesquiterpenes and non sesquiterpenes uh, of the Iridalene family. Um, they have been isolated from various uh, species of mushrooms. The first two, pyracinic acid and deliquinone, uh, are not biogenetically related to the third one, also Japonol, and indeed they don't have the same absolute configuration, R in the first cases and S in the second. Uh, what was really interesting for us is actually the, uh, the, the presence of an ID uh, symmetric quaternary uh, sterile center, which arises for the first two molecules uh, from the presence of a substituent four carbons away from the, the quad uh, center. In addition to that, the first uh, two molecules have a highly uh, uh, functionalized and quite sensitive uh, benzoquinone uh, unit. And they are actually, uh, uh, despite the deceptively uh, simple structure of these compounds, there are only two uh, enantial selective synthesis of pyracuminic acid. The first one uh, by the group of uh, Clive of the uh, antipode of the natural product, the S enantiomer. Uh, using classic evans aldor reaction to introduce uh, the first sterogenic element uh, and relatively lengthy uh, synthesis. And the much better one by Gleason of the natural enantiomer, also using um, um, asymmetric alkylation with a carol auxiliary, a home-made uh, carol auxiliary. And so our approach um, was the following. So we wanted to make um, actually three, uh, the three molecules from the same intermediate. So we wanted to make only one. Uh, configuration, so say the R or the S of the uh, three molecules from the common intermediate, which is this ID functionalized indane, that uh, we would then uh, uh, further disconnect and simplify by a classic aromatic laser rearrangement. And there we would apply a CH activation transform, and so using a Carol catalyst in order as well to control the, the configuration of the storogenic center. And so we have two possibilities. The best is to cleave the, 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 the carbon carbon bond in, in dark blue. 
and they start from this uh, arid bromide uh, where the, the bromine doesn't have has only one or two substituents so for serifying. This, this is more reactive. So we first look at this model system uh, lacking the methyl group that you find in the in the targets uh, on the benzoquinone. And actually, we had a hard time to find uh, a suitable chiral ligand for this transformation. So the first interesting result was obtained with the, the cytosymmetric chiral carbenes uh, uh, developed by Peter Kundig uh, with a relatively uh, modest enantial selectivity. And then we started to modify the carbonyl group of the substrate, so replacing the methyl ester with a larger uh, morpholine amide uh, led to uh, an increase of the enantial selectivity, so 60% PE essentially. Note that for the racemic reaction, we used the uh, Frank, Frank uh, Glorious tetramethyl ibiox uh, ligand, which works relatively well. And then uh, also to cut a long story short, we turned to a uh, Carl substrate, Carl catalyst uh, solutions to improve uh, further the steroselectivity. And to keep uh, the system simple, we uh, finally turned to the use of uh, proline derived amides. And uh, indeed, we have a matched effect, as you can see with the S uh, enantiomer of the amide, uh, polynamide substrate in combination with this enantiomer of the chiral ligand, uh, we have an optimal uh, diastor selectivity in this case. And then we decided to stop there and try to complete the, the total synthesis. So I will not describe the, the synthesis of the CH activation precursor, which is uh, involving just classic uh, chemistry alkylation, bromination alkylation chemistry. So um, this amide is then submitted to the optimal reaction conditions with the, the Carl uh, uh, NH ligands. And in this case, we got a slightly lower diastole selectivity of 85 to 15. But then after cleavage of the methoxy group and the amide, we got this uh, phenol carboxylic acid intermediate that we could crystallize and in this way uh, increase the enantial selectivity to 92% E. Uh, actually, that's the racemic mixture that crystallizes, unfortunately, and we had a hard time to determine the absolute configuration. None of the intermediates in the synthesis uh, that were in N2 and rich actually crystallized, and this doesn't happen very often, but uh, this was actually uh, the case in this story. And so we were able to ascribe there the uh, absolute configuration in collaboration with Thomas Burgi in Geneva using vibrational circular decoism. So it was ascribed as S for the major enantiomer. And then we could go on with the synthesis. Um, so classic chemistry, methylation of the ester, elevation, aromatic laser rearrangement. And then we have our common intermediate for the three targets. And so the first one, s acid, acid, so the antipode of the natural product uh, was obtained using also classic chemistry. So Johnson lemmy oxidation, reduction of the aldehyde, hydrolysis of the methyl ester, and finally oxidation, direct oxidation of the phenol to the benzoquinone. Uh, using uh, Yakura's conditions with hypervalent iodine reagents. And so the s deliquinone was obtained in the same way, just replacing sodium chlorohydride with lithium aluminum hydride in the second step. And finally, uh, Usu Japonol, which is uh, the natural enantiomer, the S, uh, was obtained uh, uh, by a triplation of the phenol and cross coupling with the uh, air stable DACO trimethyl aluminum uh, uh, reagent developed by Simon Woodward uh, in the Negishi uh, type cross coupling. And after uh, the same uh, last steps as for the liquid, we, we were able to get uh, the S-Rus to Japono. So, um, so um, I guess we showed that uh, using SP3CH activation is a very uh, simple way to make a variety of interesting ring systems, mono and, and polycyclic, from simple precursors containing a CX and CH bond. Uh, we have uh, remarkable selectivities, and tonight, I just, uh, or today, uh, for you, I just. Uh, I talked about sterol selectivity uh, issues, and this uh, sterol selectivity can be modulated both by the ancillary ligands and the base or a, a chiral contour ion. And applicability to the synthesis of complex molecules is coming. Um, I, I guess we will see more of this in the in the near future. And of course, I would like to thank the, all the uh, students, talented students and postdoc who did the work, uh, and in particular uh, the. Uh, six people that you see on the slide, important collaborations as well for this study. And um, I guess I have to stop here and apologize for me running a little bit over the time. I'd be happy to, to try to answer uh, the questions remotely. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Okay, um, th thank you very much for a lovely talk, it's great.
amazing how it's continued to develop and expand. It's uh, been a great, great story. So we've got quite a few questions, I think. So let's see. Uh, from Stanford, um, I think this is Nick from Stanford. Uh, for the indolene synthesis, how critical is the palladium phos uh, phosphine precatalyst? Is it differential? Yeah, the, there is an effect of the ligands on the uh, nitrous selectivity, but it's not that that great, actually. Um, I would say the most pronounced effect is on the yields. So this particular tricyclic phosphine is the, the most efficient. And then there is a there is also an impact on the nitrous selectivity, but uh, it's not like a major impact. Um, so I guess we tried yeah, a few uh, echol ligands, but yeah. And, and the well-defined is, is, is important. The well-defined catalyst uh, always gives uh, uh, a better reactivity. So it's more reliable than uh, you know, combinations of palladium DBA and, and tricyclic phosphine, for instance. OK, uh, another question from someone called Patron. I'm not sure from where. But what, what about the influence of the solubility of the carbonate base on the reactions? Yeah, right. Yeah, I guess this is an important. Uh, Factor that is, of course, minimized if you use a, a, a catalytic carboxylic acid because then that's uh, that's the carboxylate that does that does work. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is something that that is relatively difficult to study. But yeah, it does uh, have an influence. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what what is meant behind behind the question, but indeed you have to pay attention to the solvent based combination. In some cases, just carbonate in a polar solvent that is able to solubilize a bit of the of the carbonate is, is sufficient for the reaction to work. And um, in, in other cases, we have to use the the pivotic acid carbonate um, aromatic solvent combination, which is uh, giving better results. Okay, and then one final question: uh, uh, Does the match mismatch effect? have a, a big impact on the cell, stereoselectivity of the key step in your total synthesis of the sesquiterpenes. Maybe I should put the slide again, right? Because the, the answer was there, I suppose. The most important effect is the, the Carl ligand picture. Right. OK, great. Right, so so uh, the the Carl ligand is able to override the effect of the substrate, as you can see in the in the third entry of the uh, using the R enantiomer of the substrate in combination with the Carl ligand. So you, you get the, the same major enantiomer as uh, as in the, the first two cases. Okay, excellent. Well, Olivia, thank thank you very much for a great talk. It came thank through you. very loud and it was clear. a great experience. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, now, Olivia, you need to uh, stop sharing the screen so we get the next talk up.